the unbroken vow. I had always believed that death was the final goodbye, a solemn whisper into the void where no echo could return. But lately, the boundaries between life and death seemed to blur, as if someone was smudging the line with a careless thumb. It began subtly, with cold spots in the hallway and the faint scent of jasmine, her perfume, lingering in the air. But nothing was as chilling as the gold band that kept reappearing on my finger each morning. The ring was unmistakable. A simple gold band, slightly bent from when she'd caught it on the doorframe, just days before the accident. I had buried her with it, a symbol of a promise that was meant to last a lifetime, not a haunting. Yet, there it was, snug against my skin, feeling heavier than it ever had before. I tried to rationalize it. Sleepwalking, perhaps. A cruel prank? But the inscription inside the band, the one that read forever and always, had changed. Now, it bore a new message, till death do us part. A vow that seemed to reach beyond the grave, binding and unyielding. The days that followed were a haze of fear and confusion. I'd wake up, the ring burning on my finger, and every night I'd place it back into the velvet box I'd made for it, burying it deep within my drawer. But like a bad omen, it returned, each morning, more insistent than the last. I sought help, visiting mediums and psychics, searching for an answer. They spoke of unsettled spirits and unfinished business, but none could explain the ring's persistence. It was during one such visit that the first true horror revealed itself. As the medium held the ring, her face paled, and she whispered, she's not at rest. She's here, with you. That night, the air grew colder, the shadows in my room stretched longer, and I felt a presence, a weight on the bed beside me. I turned, and in the dim light, I saw her silhouette, a darker shade within the darkness. Her voice was a whisper, but it filled the room, you promised. Forever and always. I woke up screaming, the ring tight on my finger, the engraving mocking me with its eternal pledge. The line between life and death wasn't just blurred, it was erased. And I was trapped, bound to a promise I couldn't keep, a love that refused to die. The days blurred into weeks, and the ring remained my unyielding companion. I tried to go about my life, but the weight of her memory clung to me like a shroud. The house became colder, the walls seemed to whisper secrets, and I found myself drawn to the attic, a place I had avoided since her death. The attic was a forgotten realm, filled with dusty memories and forgotten dreams. As I climbed the creaky stairs, the air thickened, and I heard her voice, soft and insistent. Find me, she urged. Find what binds us. The attic was a graveyard of relics, old furniture, yellowed photographs, and a wooden chest that had once held her childhood treasures. I opened it, and there, nestled among moth-eaten blankets, was the wedding dress she had worn on her happiest day. Its ivory silk was still pristine, as if untouched by time. But it was the veil that caught my attention. A delicate lace, woven with intricate patterns, it had been her grandmother's. She had insisted on wearing it, believing it would bring luck. And now, it seemed to hold a secret, a connection to the other side. I draped the veil over my arm, the lace brushing against my skin. The room grew colder, and the whispers intensified. Till death do us part, they murmured. Till death do us part. I traced the veil's edges, searching for answers. And then, in the dim light, I saw it, a tiny tear, almost imperceptible. But it was enough. The veil was frayed, its threads unraveling, and with each unraveling, the bond between us weakened. I knew what I had to do. I took the veil to the backyard, where the moon hung low, casting elongated shadows. The ground was soft, as if waiting. I dug a shallow grave, the soil cool against my fingers. And there, beneath the moon's watchful gaze, I buried the veil. The whispers ceased, replaced by a hollow silence. The ring remained on my finger, but its grip loosened. I slept without dreams, without her presence haunting my nights. For a while, I believed I had broken the curse. But then, one stormy night, lightning illuminated the room, and there she stood, her eyes hollow, her lips moving soundlessly. The veil was back, draped over her ethereal form, and the ring burned, its inscription now etched in crimson. Till death do us part, she mouthed, 
and I knew then that death was no escape. She was bound to me, the veil a conduit between worlds. And as the storm raged outside, I wondered if love could be a curse, if promises made in joy could become chains and sorrow. The veil became my obsession, its delicate threads unraveling like the fabric of reality itself. I traced the tear, my fingers trembling, and wondered what lay beyond. She had always been curious, my wife, a seeker of hidden truths, a lover of mysteries. Perhaps that's why she lingered, her spirit tethered to the veil, to me. I researched ancient rituals, desperate for answers. The veil was more than lace, it was a bridge, a portal between worlds. And so, on a moonless night, I stood in the backyard, the veil clutched in my hands. The wind whispered secrets, and the stars blinked, as if urging me forward. The ritual was simple, yet its consequences were anything but. I placed the veil on the ground, its tear facing the sky. I recited the words I had found in an old grimoire, words that tasted of salt and sorrow. The earth trembled, and the veil glowed, its threads weaving a pattern only I could see. Release her, I pleaded, my voice lost in the wind. Let her find peace. The veil shuddered, and then it split, revealing a void, a darkness that threatened to swallow me whole. I stepped forward, my heart pounding, and the veil closed behind me. I was no longer in my backyard, no longer bound by earthly loss. The other side was a mirror image of our world, yet twisted, distorted. Shadows danced, and the air smelled of decay. And there, standing before me, was my wife, or what remained of her. Her eyes were hollow, her skin translucent. She wore the wedding dress, the veil now whole, its tear mended. You came, she whispered, and her voice echoed through the void. But there's a price. I knew then that I had entered a bargain, a pact with the veil itself. She reached out, her fingers brushing mine, and I felt the weight of eternity. You can stay, she said, but you'll forget. Forget everything, your name, your past, your love for me. I hesitated. The memories of our life together flooded my mind, our laughter, our fights, our stolen kisses. But they were fading, slipping through my fingers like sand. And in their place, a new truth emerged, the veil was hungry, insatiable. I'll stay, I whispered, and she smiled, her lips cold against mine. The veil wrapped around us, cocooning us in darkness. And as I forgot, I wondered if love was worth the sacrifice, if eternity was a blessing or a curse. Now, I wander this twisted realm, my memories fading, my identity slipping away. But sometimes, in the quiet moments, I glimpse her, my wife, my love, and she whispers, till death do us part. And I wonder if death was ever an end, or just the beginning of something darker. The unbroken vow remains, etched in my soul, a promise unbroken, a love unyielding. Hey! Subscribe for more scary stories. Story 2. Shifting Faces. I always believed our old home held secrets, but nothing prepared me for the chilling discovery in the dust-laden corners of the basement. Amidst the cobwebs and forgotten trinkets, an old photograph caught my eye. It was a family portrait, the kind you'd expect to see in a history book, not in your own home. The family, dressed in attire from a bygone era, stared back with an eerie stillness. I didn't recognize them, and their presence in our house puzzled me. As I peered closer, the air grew cold, and the edges of the photograph seemed to blur. The faces, once stoic, began to contort into expressions of sheer terror. Their eyes, hollow with fear, seemed to follow me, and their mouths twisted as if screaming silent warnings. I dropped the photo in shock, but when I looked again, the faces had returned to normal, their expressions blank and unchanging. Shaken, I decided to investigate the history of our home, hoping to uncover the identity of the mysterious family. The local library held archives of the town's residents, and after hours of searching, I found a match. The family was the Harringtons, who vanished without a trace over a century ago. The article mentioned a tragedy but gave no further details. That night, sleep eluded me. The faces from the photograph haunted my dreams, morphing into demonic forms, their twisted features a stark contrast to the silence of the portrait. 
I awoke to a house filled with whispers, the words indiscernible but laced with urgency. The photograph, now on my nightstand, seemed to pulsate with a life of its own. The following day, I invited my friend, an amateur psychic, to examine the photograph. She recoiled the moment she saw it, claiming it was a window to the other side, a snapshot of souls trapped in torment. She warned me to rid the house of the photograph, but curiosity anchored it to my hands. As dusk approached, the atmosphere in the house thickened. Shadows danced along the walls, and the temperature plummeted. I could feel eyes upon me, watching, waiting. The photograph's power was growing, and with it, a sense of impending doom. I knew I had to act, to delve deeper into the mystery of the Harringtons, but fear rooted me in place. The night brought no relief. The whispers grew louder, forming a cacophony of desperate pleas. I could almost make out their words, begging for release, for salvation. The photograph was no longer just an image, it was a portal, and I had unwittingly opened it. As I lay in bed, paralyzed by dread, a figure materialized at the foot of my bed, its face a shifting mask of anguish. The figure at the foot of my bed was no mere apparition. Its eyes bore into mine, pleading for release. I could almost hear its voice, a guttural whisper that echoed through the room. Help us, it seemed to say, free us from this eternal torment. I stumbled backward, my heart racing. The photograph lay on the nightstand, its edges curling as if scorched by unseen flames. The air thickened, suffocating, and I knew I had to confront the truth, the Harringtons were trapped, their souls tethered to that cursed image. Desperation drove me to research further. The town archives yielded little, but an old diary surfaced, a fragile relic hidden in the attic. The author, a maid named Eliza, had served the Harringtons during their final days. Her words trembled across the yellowed pages, recounting a sinister secret. The Harringtons had dabbled in forbidden rituals, seeking immortality. Their obsession led them to a mysterious portrait artist who promised eternal life through his brushstrokes. Eliza described the sittings, the family posing, their expressions growing more twisted with each stroke of the artist's brush. The final portrait was a grotesque mockery of life, capturing their agony as they realized the cost of their desires. The artist vanished, leaving behind the cursed photograph. Eliza's last entry revealed her own transformation, her face contorting, her screams unheard by the oblivious Harringtons. She had become the guardian of their suffering, bound to the image until someone dared to break the curse. I returned to the photograph, trembling. The faces now shifted incessantly, their pain etched deeper. Eliza's ghost lingered, urging me to unravel the mystery. But how? The artist's name remained unknown, and the ritual's details were lost to time. As the moon reached its zenith, I made my decision. Armed with the diary and a candle, I descended into the basement. The photograph awaited me, its malevolence palpable. I whispered Eliza's name, and the air crackled. The faces twisted, their silent screams louder. I traced the brush strokes with trembling fingers, retracing the artist's path. The room blurred, and I glimpsed the artist, a gaunt man with hollow eyes. His voice slithered into my mind, revealing the truth. The Harrington's immortality came at a cost, their souls trapped, their agony feeding the artist's power. Eliza's ghost materialized, her eyes pleading. Break the cycle, she urged destroy the portrait. I hesitated. The artist's curse had seeped into my bones, and I feared losing myself. But the faces, those shifting, tormented faces, compelled me. I raised the candle, its flame dancing. The photograph ignited, and the room filled with anguished wails. The faces melted, their features merging into one, a grotesque mask of suffering. The artist's voice echoed, promising retribution. The flames consumed the image, and Eliza's ghost dissolved, her final words etched in my mind, the curse is broken, but the artist remains. The flames consumed the cursed photograph, leaving behind a lingering scent of sulfur. Eliza's ghost had vanished, her purpose fulfilled, but the artist, the architect of their suffering, remained elusive. I knew my task was far from over. The diary hinted at a hidden chamber beneath the house, a place where the artist had conducted his dark rituals. 
Armed with a lantern and a sense of grim determination, I descended into the depths. The air grew colder, and the walls seemed to pulse with malevolence. The chamber was a nightmare, a twisted reflection of reality. Paintings adorned the walls, each capturing moments of agony. Faces contorted, limbs stretched, and eyes wept blood. The artist's work transcended mere art, it was a conduit for pain, a channel to the netherworld. In the center of the room stood an easel, its canvas blank. The artist materialized, his form shifting like smoke. His eyes held centuries of knowledge, and his voice slithered into my mind. You've broken the curse, he said, but at what cost? I demanded answers. Why had he ensnared the Harringtons? What drove him to create such abominations? His laughter echoed, chilling my bones. Immortality, he whispered. The ultimate masterpiece. But it requires sacrifice, the souls of the innocent. He offered me a choice, join him in eternal creation or become another face on his canvas. I refused, my resolve unyielding. The easel beckoned, and I knew my fate hung in the balance. The artist's brush hovered, poised to capture my essence. I glanced at the lantern, the flame flickering, casting shadows on the walls. An idea sparked, a desperate gamble. I lunged, knocking the easel aside. The artist screamed, his form unraveling. The lantern shattered, and the flames consumed him. As the room collapsed, I stumbled back into the basement. The house trembled, its foundation cracking. The artist's curse unraveled, and the walls bled memories, the Harrington's faces shifting one last time. Their eyes held gratitude, and then they were gone. Now, as I stand amidst the rubble, I wonder if I've truly broken the cycle. The artist's whispers linger, promising vengeance. But the photograph, the cursed relic, is no more. I've paid the price, and the house groans, its time-worn secrets laid bare. The portrait artist's legacy lives on, but perhaps in the void left by the Harringtons, there's a chance for redemption. Or perhaps the shifting faces will haunt me forever, their silent screams etched into my soul. And so, dear reader, beware the forgotten portraits, the ones that whisper of immortality and weave nightmares from brush strokes. For in their depths lies a darkness beyond comprehension, waiting to ensnare the curious and the desperate. Story 3 the Phantom Passenger. I had always prided myself on being rational, a man of science who dismissed the supernatural. But that was before the nightmares began, before I started waking up to the coppery smell of blood and faint giggles that faded with the morning light. It started exactly three years after the accident, the hit and run that I had buried deep within my conscience, convinced it was just a deer I had struck that foggy night. But she wouldn't let me forget. The girl with the emerald eyes and the bloodied school uniform appeared every time I closed my eyes. She didn't speak, she didn't have to. Her accusing stare said everything her lips did not. I began to dread sleep, for sleep brought her closer to me, made her more real than the waking world. The first time I found the bloodstains on my hands, I scrubbed them raw, telling myself it was just a manifestation of my guilt. But how could guilt leave such tangible traces? How could it echo her laughter through the halls of my once peaceful home? I sought help, of course. Therapists, psychics, even a priest. They all offered explanations, remedies, prayers. None of them worked. The girl remained, a specter only I could see, a reminder of the life I had taken and the debt I had yet to pay. As the days passed, her presence grew stronger. Objects moved on their own, doors slammed shut, and the temperature would drop so suddenly that my breath turned to mist. My friends began to distance themselves, whispering that I had changed, that I was obsessed. Maybe I was. Obsessed with finding peace, with driving her away. But tonight was different. Tonight, the laughter wasn't just in my ears, it was all around me, bouncing off the walls, seeping through the cracks in the floorboards. And when I opened my eyes, she was there, at the foot of my bed, blood dripping from her hands onto mine. The girl's laughter echoed through the dimly lit room, and I could feel her gaze piercing my soul. Her eyes, once innocent, now held a malevolence that chilled me to the bone. I tried to speak, to ask her what she wanted, but my voice failed me. 
Instead, I watched as she extended her blood-streaked hand toward me. Remember, she whispered, her voice a haunting melody. Remember what you did. I had no choice but to follow her lead. She led me to the attic, where dust-covered boxes held forgotten memories. She pointed to one, the box labeled keepsakes. Trembling, I opened it, revealing a faded photograph of a little girl with emerald eyes. It was her, the girl I had killed. Why? I choked out. Why won't you let me forget? Her laughter intensified, filling the room until it seemed to press against my chest. Because you promised, she said. You promised to remember. I had no recollection of such a promise, but the girl's insistence was unyielding. She guided my trembling hand to a rusty knife lying among the keepsakes. The blood packed, she murmured. To atone for your sin. I hesitated, but the weight of guilt pushed me forward. The blade sliced through my palm, and I watched in horror as my blood mingled with hers. The room spun, and I felt myself falling, falling into darkness. When I woke, the girl was gone, but the bloodstains remained. My hand throbbed, and the laughter still echoed in my ears. I stumbled downstairs, desperate for answers. The old woman next door, the one who had lived here for decades, knew the truth. You're not the first, she said, her eyes filled with sorrow. The girl, the one you killed, she's been seeking justice for years. She chooses someone, someone like you, to carry her burden. But why? I whispered. Because she can't rest until her killer pays, the old woman replied. And now, you're bound to her. The blood pact ensures it. I tried to flee, but the girl's presence followed me. She whispered in my dreams, urging me to find her body, to give her a proper burial. And so, I dug in the moonlit graveyard, my hands clawing at the earth until I uncovered her remains. But as I laid her bones to rest, the laughter turned to screams. The ground trembled, and the tombstone cracked. The girl emerged, her eyes no longer accusing, but pleading. Help me, she begged. Help me find peace. And that's when I realized, the blood pact wasn't just about atonement. It was a pact of vengeance. The girl wanted more than my guilt, she wanted my soul. And as the earth swallowed me whole, I knew I was bound to her forever. The girl's laughter haunted me, even as I tried to escape her grasp. The blood pact had bound us together, and now, I was no longer sure where she ended and I began. My once rational mind had fractured, and the line between reality and nightmare blurred. I returned to the old woman, desperate for answers. She sat in her dimly lit living room, surrounded by dusty books and flickering candles. You've seen her, she said, her voice a whisper. The girl who seeks vengeance. I nodded, my heart pounding. What does she want from me? The old woman leaned closer, her eyes filled with ancient knowledge. She wants you to remember, she said. Remember the night you took her life. Remember the screech of tires, the sickening thud, and the way you fled into the darkness. But why? I asked. Why torment me? Because, the old woman said, she cannot rest until justice is served. The blood pack demands it. I thought of the girl's emerald eyes, the way they bore into my soul. How do I break the pact? You must find her body, the old woman replied. Bury her properly, and perhaps she will release you. And so, I followed her instructions. I traced the accident back to the foggy night, the night that had changed everything. The girl had been walking home from school, her backpack heavy with textbooks. I had been reckless, speeding through the narrow road, and when I saw her, it was too late. I found her grave in an overgrown cemetery, the headstone cracked and weathered. As I dug, the earth seemed to fight back, clawing at my hands, but I persisted. The girl's bones emerged, fragile and brittle. Tears blurred my vision as I cradled her skull, whispering apologies. But when I laid her to rest, the ground trembled. The tombstone shattered, and the girl rose, her eyes no longer accusing but filled with gratitude. Thank you, she said. Thank you for setting me free. I expected peace, closure, but instead, the laughter returned. 
the girl's laughter, now mingled with mine. She had taken something from me, the last remnants of my sanity. And as I stared into her eyes, I understood. The blood pact wasn't about justice, it was about revenge. She had become my phantom passenger, my constant companion. Every time I closed my eyes, she was there, whispering secrets, urging me to remember. And now, as I stand on the edge of the cliff, the wind howling around me, I know what I must do. The girl's laughter echoes in my ears, urging me forward. The final toll awaits, a leap into the abyss, a sacrifice to break the pact. But will it be enough? Will she finally find peace, or will she drag me down with her? The choice is mine, and as I step off the precipice, I wonder if redemption awaits or if the girl's laughter will follow me into eternity. The end. Subscribe for more. Thanks for watching.